Good evening and welcome to the first Jennifer Ward Oppenheimer Lecture on the Deep History and Archaeology of Africa. This is a new annual lecture series held to honour the late Jennifer Ward Oppenheimer in recognition of her deep interests in and commitment to advancing scholarship in the fields of African paleoanthropology, human evolution, wildlife conservation and research and practical efforts aimed at creating, and, uh, creating sustainable environments alongside her commitments to supporting health and education initiatives on the African continent and empowering African scholars and societies. I'm delighted that Jennifer's husband, Jonathan Oppenheimer, is here with us today. Um, and I'd like to personally welcome him and our inaugural lecturer in this series, Professor Saresane Alemsaged, or Zare, as he likes to be known. Pro Professor Alemsaged is the Donald N. Pritziger Professor in the Department of Organismal Biology and Anatomy at the University of Chicago. He studied for a BSc in Geology at Addis Ababa University and an MSc in Paleontology at the University of Montpellier before moving to the Sorbonne to study for his PhD in Paleoanthropology. Prior to joining the University of Chicago, he was a senior curator of anthropology at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, where he held the Irvine Chair of Anthropology. He was also adjunct professor at San Francisco uh, at the University of California, Davis, and a research professor at San Francisco State University. Before joining the California Academy of Sciences, he was a senior scientist in the Department of Human Evolution at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, and a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State University. His research focuses on the events surrounding the origin and diversification of early hominins in the Mayo Pliocene and how these processes were shaped by underlining environmental and ecological factors, by underlying e environmental and ecological factors. He has pioneered efforts to discern phylogenetic relationships and patterns of species diversity, diversity among early hominins by deciphering their anatomical, behavioural, locomotor and dietary adaptations, while also placing these developments in their paleoenvironmental and paleoecological contexts. He regularly undertakes fieldwork in his home country, Ethiopia, and is a founder and director of the Dikika Research Project and the Mililogia Project, and is most well known for his discovery of Selam, the nearly complete skeleton of a three-year-old Australopithecus afarensis, often referred to as the world's oldest child. He is also the co-founder and president of the East African Association for Paleoanthropology and Paleontology and a co-founder and leader of the African Rift Valley Research Consortium. He has published widely in the Journal of Human Evolution, Nature, Science Advances and PNAS, among other outlets, while at the same time maintaining an active profile in public engagement by TV and radio, including on CNN and Nova PBS, and presenting TED Talks. It is truly a great honour to have such a distinguished scholar present the first Jennifer Ward Oppenheimer lecture in the deep history and archaeology of Africa. Welcome, Sir Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. I'm very humbled and honoured to be the uh, inaugural speaker uh, at the heavy weight. I hope that I do justice to your time and uh, patience tonight. Okay. Is that good? Thank you. Before I start, I must thank uh, the department, Paul, Matt, and my colleagues Rob. Emily, Martha, I can go on. I am very, very happy to be here today. 
And uh, when I asked what I should be talking about today, uh, as Paul said, I'm interested in many aspects of early hominin evolution. And I decided to talk about maybe three important aspects of what makes us human. Use of tools, presence or lack of childhood, and how we locomote. Of course, not necessarily as homo sapiens, but our ancestors. And I really focus on Australopithecus. And as you can see, the tongue child here was discovered in 1924 in South Africa, where Jonathan is from, actually. And the, on the right is the Pekika child that uh, uh, Paul mentioned. And the picture that we had about Australopithecus in 1924 was that it was not recognized because Africa cannot. It was hard for some to accept that Africa would be the crate of mankind. In the 80s, it was not about whether it was an Australopithecus, but it's more of, oh, did it climb, did it run, did it cook, did it eat, did it drink, and things like that. And today, we can ask more sophisticated questions regarding behavior even. So I would like to put my presentation in that context. It will work, of course. So Darwin, uh, whose room I uh, saw today, thanks to Rob, said uh, it's somewhat more probable that our early ancestors lived on the African continent than elsewhere. Uh, you will agree, uh, he's a genius. He said this without the genetic or fossil evidence. Today, with that evidence, we're still struggling to make sense of that question. And therefore, when Raymond Dart found the tongue child in South Africa, uh, it was not the first fossil, because it was a cowboy specimen, but it was the first recognized fossil from Africa. And he named it Australopithecus. He knew that it was bipedal, but then had a small brain that bothered uh, many, especially the British intelligence shaft at that point, because brain had to come. The sine qua non of being human was brain. And he didn't have the brain, which is expected for you to be in the family of humans. When Raymond Dart being tenacious and fierce, he fought hard, but later he was recognized after 30, 40 years of struggle. And therefore, Indeed, Africa was the cradle of mankind. And that was followed by the Liki, who took us to the eastern part of the whole, the Africa. Really, you know, the old Vyborg, etc., where we actually started to see the evidence for stone tools. And that was followed by people like Donald Johansson, who discovered Lucy. <coughs> And the adventure continues. You can see myself and Johansson next to the original fossils of Lucy in the museum in Ethiopia. All that is to say, today we're not really asking whether Africa is, Africa is a cradle of human beings or not. In fact, when you look at the genetic evidence, we clearly know today that we have a common ancestor with the chimpanzees who also live in Africa, who in fact inspired Darwin to, to say what he said, based on the morphological evidence that he had before his eyes. We know that we separated from the chimpanzees sometime seven million years ago. And our job, the job of like myself and many here are, to fill in this branch and see what happened between the divergence from the chimpanzees and up all the way up to the emergence of our species, sometimes rendered thousand years ago again in Africa. The genetic evidence is great because it tells us when we split from the chimpanzees, but also thanks to the Nobel Prize winner's uh, pioneering work and many followed, we also know whether we interacted with other, with other species or but it doesn't necessarily give you the different steps caused the split with the chimpanzees. That's where then the hard evidence comes in the form of fossils 
and the fossils then show us that indeed our ancestry is very diverse with so many experiments. And when you look at this picture, you have this, what I call key minus 20 events in human evolution. The first phase is characterized by what we call facultative bipeds. We know they were largely arboreal species, but they did some, type, some form of uh, upright walking. In that, you will have Ardipithecus, Anantropus, Auroran, etc., etc. Call them facultative bipeds. Those are the early, that's the early phase of uh, our emergence as a unique, distinct lineage that we call hominin lineage. And then you will have Homo coming at around 2.5, 2.7 million years ago. But the earliest hominins represented by species like Ardipithecus and Homo are bridged by this key group called the Australopithecines, specifically Australopithecus, to which the tongue child in the discovery that uh, we made in Dikika belong, including Lucy as well. So these three main phases, the facultative bipeds, the early ones, the habitual bipeds, the Australopithecines, Australopithecus, and then the obligate bipeds, after Homo erectus especially, are not going to necessarily have the same behavior because the way they will interact with their environment are different, not necessarily the same. But today I'll focus specifically on the genus Australopithecus and see how that genus, that group, plays that pivotal bridging role connecting us connecting the earlier species and what comes later in the form of the genus Homo. And to achieve that, I will take you to the field. Uh, this was supposed to work. Uh, no, no, no. It's not supposed to work, actually. It needs to be maybe pressed. OK. Okay, I will try it again. So because Australopithecus is placed between the two groups, the facultative and the obligate, the, the picture that we have of Australopithecus is, of, of course, a mosaic, a mix of features. The mix of features uh, that you see in Australopithecus, meaning the head will have a small brain, it will have a jetting face, rather chip-like uh, cranium, but the foreign magnum will be more anteriorly placed because you're bipedal. The shoulder area will be more ape-like, but when you go down to the pelvis, it will be very human-like. And go further to the foot, it will be more human-like. So what you see, therefore, retentions from the ancestral conditions and shared with what will, will come later. That was the video. There was the videos comparing a chimpanzee, a human, and an Australopithecus. So keep that picture. With that, Let's go to Africa, especially Eastern Africa, particularly Ethiopia, which is in the northeastern part. And a site called the Kika that Paul uh, mentioned is where I conduct fieldwork, among other sites. And the site is part of the big rift system, which is known for many famous discoveries like Ardipithecus, uh, Lucy, and the Gona stone tools and uh, Kadanumu, uh, you mentioned in Martha, all of these sites are actually concentrated in a very relatively small area. And Dukika is at the heart of all of these sites. Uh, I would like to recognize my colleagues who actually do a lot of work so I can stand here before you and talk because we do our work in a uh, international and multidisciplinary uh, form. Uh, you need a lot of money, a lot of people, and a lot of expertise to undertake this work. But you actually need very focused ex expertise in paleoanthropology, archaeology, geology, paleontology, and of course students. So 
all of them, <laughs> not always, only sometimes. <laughs> But then it's, it's a combination of all these people from different countries, uh, different continents, and uh, different expertise that you're able to do our work, and so I can come talk to you today. So it's not just me uh, behind all the discoveries that I'm going to talk about. I happen to be the leader of the project. So field work, as you know, is very exciting, and you can see me here next to a uh, an uh, elephant pulpus, which is just coming out of the metrics here. Uh, I'm showing a, a femur of a hominin next to my uh, uh, friend Dene. And that picture is actually the discovery uh, of the Dikika child. It was just four of us at that point. I did not have a big team that you saw. Actually, I was 29, I think. I had just finished from the University of Paris. And I don't think many people are excited to work with you when, when you know. <laughs> so uh, I went to those remote places, and I needed uh, someone to look after me, actually, because it was very remote. And I'm not in that picture, because I only had this click-click cameras. Maybe some of you don't know even what they existed. And uh, the guy in the, uh, the guy sitting with the hat is the person who, who, looked, who spotted it first. And I was the only scientist doing everything during this first season. So the big team that you saw joined me once uh, things stabilized and I had more resources. Uh, and the discovery was uh, made uh, here. This is uh, the cranium. Uh, and the only thing I'd like to point out here is that it's, this one is a volcanic ash dated to 3.4 million years ago, uh, using potassium argon techniques. So it's like a textbook thing. So if you're here, you're slightly above the 3.4 million years old, so it means that it's maybe younger than 3.4. So already, even though I was the only scientist when the discovery was made, I was able to tell, uh, my background is also in geology, so I was able to tell that it cannot be far removed from 3.4 million years, and today we know that it's a skeleton which is 3.32 uh, million years old. But recovering the entire skeleton here took five more years, so we would go back to, this, to the same site, look after, uh, 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 and then explore and excavate and sift. And what you see is uh, my friend showing you which part of the skeleton comes from where, like at the bottom, Danny is showing you the knee comes from that spot, and Robley is showing you to his head that's where the, this uh, that cranium comes from. But that took five years of, uh, uh, of uh, sifting, and it's, of course, it's a hot place, uh, but it's, it's a lot of work. So what is then the significance? Uh, the, there is a, a lot to say about this discovery, but I'm going to focus only on two things. Uh, because what I would like to achieve today is because I'm going to claim that Australopithecus, the picture of Australopithecus that we had, say in the 80s, we can forget even 1924 in the 80s, is different from the one that we have today. And what I'm going to say, therefore, is this is how we contributed to making that new picture of Australopithecus emerge, so we can depict a, a different, a different uh, you know, painting of the genus Australopithecus. And to do that, as I said, I'll talk about stone tools, the presence or lack of childhood-like thing, and I say that on purpose, and uh, whether Australopithecus practiced arboreal behavior or not. Because in the 80s, Australopithecus afarensis was pictured as a striding, fully bipedal, uh, where uh, arboreal behavior was not really significant for its survival. Of course, no one talked about childhood-related things. And of course, it was also assumed to be a non-tool user, a non-tool using, stone tool using, uh, species or taxa. So uh, all those uh, cover page publications then pertain to how magnificent the specimen is and using some of the key elements, especially the scapula, how we learn about its locomotor repertoire and how 
uh, based on the endocast, which is fully preserved, as you can see it here, uh, we were able to talk about brain development-like thing that would help us infer uh, whether there was some type of slowed type of uh, brain development, protracted way of brain development. So that is where I'm headed now. And at the end, I'll briefly mention uh, whether Australopithecus has used tontos or not. But before that, we need to know how old this individual is and whether she is a he, what? Whether it is a he or a she. To do the uh, uh, sexing, all we did is we looked at the canine size, because canine size is dimorphic in many primates, as you know, but especially in Australopithecus afarensis, meaning males have larger canine, females have smaller canine. Uh, this is when you, just if you are not familiar, if you look at a baboon male, they have very big canine. If it is a female, they would have a small canine. And using the CT scan technology, this is the original fossil. What you don't see are the still developing teeth that are hidden here in the, in the inside and here. But you can see them over there. That is a canine. These are the two incisors. This is the third premolar. That is the fourth premolar. And the same thing in the mandible on the lower jaw. So based on this, first of all, the canine is small. That's how we know that it was a female. Meaning you have a range for Australopithecus afarensis. It was within the lower limit in terms of its size, dimension, for that range of that species. Therefore, it's a female. To know how old it was, first we used an old technique. And that is, for uh, if I was to ask you uh, how many uh, I, I don't think I need to ask this audience. So six to seven year old children have close to 40 teeth in their mouth, sometimes 42. And that is because they have two sets of dentition. The baby teeth, that's out, like in here, and the adult teeth, that is still developing inside. So depending on how many teeth the individual has accumulated at that critical moment, because if you were to find this specimen before, you wouldn't have had as many adult teeth that are hidden inside. If you were to wait a little more, then the baby teeth would have been gone once the adult teeth have their roots, you would push them out. That's how we shed our teeth when we were five, six, seven, eight, nine. So what you say is, given the number of teeth in that mouse, would this be a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, if it was a chimpanzee or a human. So you're using a chimp or a human model. And we said, well, for that number of these to be accumulated, if it was a human, because we grow slowly, it would be maybe four. If it was a chimpanzee, it would be maybe two. So we took the average, we said, Afarensis is neither a chimp nor a human. It should be three. That's what we did in our nature paper. So it was not really science rocket. <laughs> Okay. And we use that number to do our analysis. How the brain developed, how maturity occurred, etc., etc. But then, using the synchrotron technology, we were able to dive deeper. This work was done at the uh, Grenoble facility with uh, Paul Tafro, first for many of my colleagues. And really, you can dive deep into the jaws and see an amazing pattern of dental uh, configuration. What you see are the permanent incisor, the other incisor, the baby teeth, uh, the first molar permanent, and then the second one, which doesn't even have roots here. Why am I showing you this? Yes, it's nice, but what you can do with the synchrotron technology is we can count what we call the growth lines. When your crown, your teeth are forming, they are layering up like a sedimentary rock. So every day there are lines forming in our teeth. Actually, they are so conspicuous that you can count them. And what we did, therefore, is, as you can see there, we counted the number of days in the both canine and the molar. Meaning you can count day one, day two, day three, day four. You can even capture 
the what we call the birth line here. The birth line is very conspicuously outlined when you look through the synchrotron technology because it is a moment which is very, very stressful for the baby and of course for the mother. You can see that the uh, layering is altered. So you can actually capture the day of birth of this individual who lived 3.5 million years ago. Okay? So then you start, we know baby was born here, and you go all the way down, and here, the canine, its development is truncated here, it's stopped. What happened? Baby died. So what you have here is a birth certificate of an individual who, three, who died 3.5 million years ago. So what we did, we counted all the lines, and we were able to say that child didn't die at the age of three, but at 2.36 years. So you have access to the number of years, number of months, and number of days. And that is an absolute death, uh, age of death of that individual. Why is it important? Well, because now we can use that figure to analyze aspects that we would like to understand about, say, brain development, for example. So, so we know, therefore, that the child died at the age of 2.36 years, number one. It died 3.3 million years ago. It belongs to the genus Australopithecus, specifically Australopithecus afarensis. I spared you from the details of morphology so I can cover more of the results, but I would be happy to answer other questions. So now what we want to know is what type of brain development we have or we had in this creature known as Australopithecus afarensis. We want to know how the brain developed because if your brain is developing slowly, it means that someone is caring for you. In humans, we know it at least. Babies are born very, very immature, both in terms of their brain, but also somatically. When you see an antelope born, they get born and they run away that our babies can't fend for, them, for themselves. Even after six years, well, sometimes 18, <laughs> then there's a lot is happening. In other words, human juveniles are highly dependent. And human neonates are born only with 30% of the adult size of their brain. So someone will have to help uh, grow that, that, that brain. And with highly dependent offsprings, humans care for babies through all of these things, pair bonding, grandparenting, other parenting, daycare, school fees, college tuitions, and all of that, someone has to do it. Why? Because we cannot support ourselves until some point, up to some point. Given this, because I am interested in the origins of what we call our human attributes, such as bipedal locomotion, expanded brain, childhood present or absent, uh, etc. All of those attributes have origins at some point. So if we are going to have an insight into, for example, when these things happened, we can examine maybe by looking at how the brain was growing. Was it growing fast or slow? Within apes, if it's faster, it would be more like chimpanzee. If it's slower, it would be more like human. Because in contrast to humans, African apes, uh, the, the human brain growth pattern is protracted. It takes time. One, first, it's big. Second, at birth, we have only small percentage formed, as I said. So this would, of course, provide a longer interval for cognitive development and is believed to have uh, uh, to facilitate neural connectivity, etc. So yes, we are born with a small brain, which is costly for the, those who are caring, but it also gives the opportunity for, uh, for the baby to learn skills, including language and uh, other, other cognitive skills. So question I'm asking is why and when did this behavior emerge in our evolutionary history, and can we test this using the fossil record? 
Well, you may have heard of the obstetrics dilemma hypothesis. What it says is it holds that antagonistic selection for a large neonatal brain, because you have big brain, and a bipedally adapted narrow birth canal, because when we became upright walkers, we narrowed the birth canal, which is crazy. You expand the brain, but you narrow the birth canal. Then that would pose a problem for childbirth. So the obstetrics dilemma would say, then hormonal solution was to truncate gestation, resulting in atrial neonates. So if you want to have a big brain, but narrow birth canal, because you cannot give birth to a big brain individual, you truncate gestation and give birth to an immature infant. So I'm not saying this is true, but that is one of the hypotheses that's out there. So then in animal show trade-off, the natural selection favors shorter gestation periods, less developed neonates, and in order to accommodate locomotion and encephalization. So it's a trade-off between the two. That's what the hypothesis says anyway. Let's see. In a different way, what we can ask is whether the pattern of brain growth in the small brain Australopithecus afferens is more similar to chimpanzees or humans. If it's more chimp-like, then there was no protracted brain growth. If it's human-like, then it is maybe human-like. To do that, we look at endocast, and fortunately, the specimen that I discovered, or my team discovered, has its endocast preserved. And endocast is nothing but the impression of the, uh, the, the brain case. Uh, it gives you the, 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 you can measure the size of the brain, but also you can go to the details of like uh, Emily and her students do. You can map the configuration of the different uh, uh, salsa and gyri, so you know what type of distribution of the different parts of the brain you had. And here is the brain, the endocast, and the good thing about this novel techniques is that you can simply remove the, uh, the skull and have your endocast. And this is the endocast of the, the child that I discussed, the Dikikai child. Meaning, you can clearly measure the brain size of this one easily. And then you can also look at the outer morphology and try to discern the different uh, compilations. And uh, of course, with my colleagues like Philip Gunz, we've done many other adult specimens also. Uh, I want to mention one thing, and that is in order to do what I'm going to share or show you right now, we need two things. Number one, we need the brain size and the age of death. The age of death, I told you, was 2.36. But the brain size, also, we were able, we were able to directly measure how, how big it was. And by the age of 2.36, with a brain size of about 250 cc, only 63 to 73 of this individual's brain was formed. In a chimpanzee, it would be higher. In a human, it would be less. But let's see, slightly less. Which means, if you look at this chart, this is age of individuals going from zero to 10. And what you see is that chimpanzees are here in green. What does that says? It's simple. They have a small brain. Oh, wow. Surprise. <laughs> and humans have a higher brain. What you see that, of course, Australopithecus represented here by two juveniles, the Dikika fossil and another specimen also have small brains, but it seems that it's below, within the range for, uh, uh, below the average for, uh, for uh, chimpanzees, whereas the adults are slightly above the average. It means that they have to do more work to acquire the adult brain amounts that you'll see in their uh, species. So the average adult endocrine volume, EV is endocrine volume of afferences, is larger than in pan, whereas the juveniles have slightly 
smaller than what you see in pan. So when you do then the relative endocrinal volume, this is the amount of brain formed at that stage, the juvenile stage, as a percentage of the adult one. How much of the brain was formed at the age of, say, 2.5? And as you can see, that chimpanzees will have formed more at any given dental stage or developmental stage because they are growing faster. Humans are here in blue. And the two juveniles are smack within the human distribution. So what we see in our analysis is even though the brain is small, the way they are achieving their adult value is delayed or protracted as we see it in humans. Uh, that was both surprising and uh, interesting. In other words, the relative endocrine volume indicates prolonged brain growth in afferences in that it takes longer for individuals to reach their adult endocrine volume. They are taking their time. And therefore, our findings are suggesting that brain growth in afferences was as protracted as in modern humans, clearly similar to modern humans than to chimpanzees. So, question is therefore, is, does this support the obstetrics dilemma hypothesis? N no, I don't think so. Why? Because the species don't have big brain. <laughs> Remember, the obstetrics dilemma hypothesis holds said, because you have a big brain and narrow birth canal, you need to give birth early. But these guys do not have big brain. But still, the brain development seems to be slowed. Uh, for some reason, a slide is missing. So, in conclusion, therefore, on this topic, is that even though the brain is small in Australopithecus afarensis, this is 3.5 million years ago, there is a prolonged or protracted brain growth. When I try to explain this, or we try to explain this in, the, in terms of obstetrics to the hypothesis, it doesn't work because they have a small brain. So I think what may have happened is, uh, hopefully, yeah, this one is what I wanted. There was a slide that was there. So the brain was small, ape-like. Its organization also was ape-like. So I think also repeated because had protracted brain development, similar to what you see in humans by 3.5 million years ago. And this suggests that protracted brain growth is not a mere byproduct of brain expansion, bipedality, and narrow birth canal. That's what I was trying to find out. So what explains it? I'm thinking of something uh, that has to do with this new hypothesis. Well, it's not new, actually. Uh, it was proposed by another person a long time ago. The EGG, which is the energetics of gestation and growth hypothesis, what it says is that a, it's a metabolic hypothesis which suggests that gestation ends when pregnancy reaches a critical point at which the mother can no longer support her growing fetus. And this is observed across mammals. Now, why is then in afarensis uh, gestation being truncated? Why is it not supporting the pregnancy? Uh, Australopithecus afarensis is the first to venture into the more wooded, more open environment to incorporating more C4 type of diet. And C4 diet is mainly grass. It's not really rich in terms of calories. And I think it has to do with something uh, that is truncating gestation, probably because of the diet, which is not as energy rich as uh, uh, like fruits and other resources that maybe chimpanzees have. Again, as I said, the only thing that I would say today is brain development in Africa is protracted. Could this explain it? Perhaps. Could we explain it using obstetrics dilemma? I don't think so. But this needs further testing, and I'm sure there are other people who know more about these issues than myself. But I think there was some type of incipient childhood in Australopithecus afarensis. Because if you don't have enough brain, if you're infant and immature, then someone would have to. Careful. 
Interestingly, and uh, I know Amani would be uh, happy about this, uh, the, while the brain is protracted in afferences, the configuration, meaning, say, the ratio between the visual cortex, the motor cortex, and the uh, frontal cortex, is more chimp-like. I would say only one thing. There is this, lunate, this line called lunate sulcus. In chimpanzees, it's more forward because the visual cortex is proportionally larger than to the other parts of the brain. In humans, our visual cortex is smaller relative to the other parts of because our prefrontal cortex is highly developed. So the configuration of the brain in afferences, however, was very chimpanzee-like. So what you see is a chimp-like configuration, but a human-like protracted brain development. From the evolutionary point of view, it's not surprising because evolution is mosaic. It makes us think there is no jump from a chimp to a human, of course. Now, let's shift gears and ask a different question. What I try to do, what I'm trying to do today is because I know that the audience is diverse, I don't want to just talk about just one topic, but give you snapshots of different topics that were covered by our team. And the second question is, if then what I said is true, we can ask another question. Did Australopithecus afarensis climb, or did Australopithecus climb trees or not? I'm asking this question because there is no one, no one is questioning whether Australopithecus was bipedal or not. So let's close that file. They were bipedal, they were habitual bipedal. The debate is whether they also practice arboreal uh, or arboreality or they have arboreal lifestyle or not. Well, why is this question important? Very simple. If you are arboreal versus not, the type of pressure, selective pressure, that will act upon you are not going to be the same. The type of competition you will have, both intra and interspecies, is not going to be the same. In other words, by being arboreal or not, the landscape becomes completely different from the ecological point of view. So it's not just a matter of to see whether you are climbing or running or dancing. It is really more biologically meaningful questions than uh, that. So did Australopithecus climb or not? The debate, and uh, Rob knows this very well, it was so polarized. You would have one group saying, if you find an ape-like character, so for example, if you have a bipedal hominin, but you have features like long fingers, for example, uh, 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 foot that does not have the two arches, uh, etc., etc., they would say, well, it's fully bipedal, and those features are simply retention from the, the ancestral condition. They don't have any significance for locomotion. That's one, one group. The other will try to interpret every feature that they see, which is if like in habitual bipedal species like Australopithecus, they mean something. And that is a 40-year-old debate. So I think what I'm going to suggest here may be that we should test it case by case when we have the fossil material especially. So, rather than dwell into the type of debate, I'll give you an example how our research contributed to addressing aspects of this work, and I say aspects. But this question is really broader than that. It pertains to does form equal fun function? That's what we are asking, which is inherently a very important biological question. Answer could be yes or false, so that's why we need a case-by-case -case investigation. And I'm going to use the scapula. This is at the Musée de l'Homme. And this is, I'm using the scapula first, because we have the fossil. Second, it's widely accepted that the characteristics of the bone are strongly influenced by how the shoulder is used, whether when you're making tools, or running, or climbing. As you can see, species like this one, uh, that we call pronograde species, where their body is horizontal to the ground, and orthograde species like apes can easily be separated based on the shape of their scapula. So the, the scapula is telling us something about 
a locomotor adaptation of that specific group. Say orthograms, chronograms, for example. But the scapula are absent in the fossil record, unfortunately. And this fossil, again, offers that opportunity. But when discovered, this is what we had of the scapula. I don't know if you can see anything. So this took 12 years of work to extract the bone scapula from here. And you can see the different stages of preparation manually by myself and Christopher Chiari from the National Museum of Kenya. After 12 years, we have now the scapula here for study that belongs to Australopithecus afarensis, and we have two of them. The scapula, as you could know, is very thin, paper thin, so it doesn't really fossilize easily. So this was really a great opportunity for us to study. So what we do is that that scapula look human-like, chimp-like, orang-like, or gorilla-like. And you can see the scapula here. It is significantly closer to gorillas. So I remember when I did quickly in 2006, did quickly this uh, PC analysis, not specifically this one, but the one before it. And it was looking like scapula. You can imagine, I was just, why, why is it looking like, okay, human, okay, but then at least chimpanzee, why scapula? Because I know chimpanzees are closer to Australopithecus. But you know, you don't dictate morphology. You can dictate your thoughts <laughs> or your conclusions, but you cannot dictate morphology. But it is significantly similar to gorillas. And actually, you can see it here. You can see the supraspinatus uh, muscle, the supraspinous fossa, which takes the supraspinatus, is broad, as in gorilla. Here is the gorilla. The infraspinatus is not as prominent as in humans. So in many ways, it's gorilla-like. You can see it here but you can see it here also, significantly gorilla-like. This is a canonical variant analysis. So, believe me that the scapula of this individual is gorilla-like. So, but then, back to that question. If it's gorilla-like, was this gorilla-like morphology a primitive retention or had some adaptive significance? Well, let's look at what we call salient features that would have some meaning for inter interpretation of locomotion. This is the uh, glenohumeral joint. So you have your humerus, proximal humerus. It goes and joins the glenoid cavity. So in apes, it's cranially oriented or superiorly oriented. Basically, shoulder joint in humans, it's sideways, it's transversely oriented. In apes, it is cranially oriented. Why? Because they do a lot of activities about that requires that the hand be above the shoulder. Humans are mostly manipulating from here, so it needs to be more transverse. If you have a shoulder that's like this and you want to manipulate things, then you'll have to tear your muscles and vice versa for the chimpanzees. So, what do we see? Both juvenile Australopithecus here and adults are very ape-like. You can see humans here. Homo erectus is human-like. Even the habits, Homo fluorescensis, is not only human-like, but superhuman-like, if you want. OK? So the glenohumeral joint is ape-like, number one. Number two, the spine. And the spine is a ridge that separates the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. Again, the same thing. It's ape-like. And it's also oriented superiorly. And as I said, you do that when you have another activities that require a hand above the shoulder. And then the infraspinous fossa, this one. That is a muscle. And its configuration is, again, in the juvenile Australopithecus, it's ape-like. You can see humans again. You can see Homo erectus, very human-like. But again, very ape-like, based on the scapula. And the, the supraspinatus muscle 
is uh, again the muscle that helps you do this. The infraspinatus muscle is the muscle that helps you do things below the arm. Okay. And what you see here is chimpanzees, as they grow older, they become more terrestrial. This is climbing, that is being terrestrial. So chimpanzees and gorillas become more terrestrial, uh, more knuckle walkers, in other words, to uh, when, they, when they come on ground, when they become older. But when they're younger, they do a lot of climbing. And what is interesting is the supraspinous fossa expands in chimpanzees and gorillas as they grow older, meaning that is a signal that as they were becoming more terrestrial, more knuckle walkers, the supraspinous is expanding. That was interesting. Whereas in humans who don't climb, in Pongo who climb, but they don't do vertical climbing, and they're not really doing a lot of things in terms of knuckle walking also as much as gorillas, it doesn't expand. So what the suggest therefore is, the scapula is actually telling us something about the locomotor adaptation because as they grow older, become more terrestrial or knuckle walkers, the morphology and the amount of inf infraspinatus is expanding. So you can use that to interpret their morphology. So based on all those important features, therefore, the orientation of the glenohumeral hybrid joint is superiorly oriented. The infraspinatus is expanding. Uh, so we can use those features to interpret whether you have uh, a feature that you can use to interpret locomotion rather than, say, primitive or significant without testing it this way. So uh, in sum, therefore, is that the gorilla-like scapula in afferences is not a primitive retention, but is functionally significant. And climbing was an important aspect of its daily life. And therefore, what may have happened is while, while bipedal, like gorillas are knuckle walkers, they may have gone to the trees for nesting and feeding, and that is key for your adaptation, of course. You need to feed, to feed yourself and nest. So you can imagine Australopithecus as habitually biped on the ground, but they went back to the trees uh, when they wanted to feed sometimes and also nest. And that really means the picture that you have of Australopithecus afferences on the landscape is not this like striding biped as was uh, imagined for long. As you can see, by the time Homo erectus comes, the infraspinatus is huge human-like, and then very minuscule supraspinatus. So it's at, at, at during Homo erectus that you see the abandonment or uh, the, uh, the, uh, the removal of arboreal lifestyle from the hominid repertoire. Before that, they were doing a lot of climbing. And that, of course, uh, means uh, 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 that with the new uh, human-like pattern of brain development, with bipedal locomotion present, but also our modern lifestyle is also present, the picture of the, the, uh, the genus is not necessarily the same as we had it in the 80s, for example. Now, if I can take 10 minutes, I can finish, but then if people are tired, I can stop it. <laughs> So the last one is actually for the archaeologist. I was trying to do justice to everyone. <laughs> Did Australopithecus use stone tools? Okay, why am I asking this question? Well, you know the implicit hypothesis, Homo equals tools, coming from all the way from the Lewis Leakey uh, group. And we had the Guna tools at 2.6. Early Homo was 2.5 million years old. And you had the cut marks from middle of our site, which were also related to 2.5. So up until 2010, the three coincided. Cut marks dated to 2.5. Early homo emerging at 2.5. And then stone tools at 2.5. And then, of course, homo habilis, the handyman, being like the implicit hypothesis. It's against this background that we published this paper in 2010 claiming that Australopithecus actually was able to use stone tools and remove meat off the bones. 
while not everyone was happy, <laughs> because it's a major claim. Again, same site, Dikika. The site where these guys were discovered is only 200 meters from the site of the discovery of the Dikika chart, which I discussed. So we knew the site very well. So paleontologists like myself, when we go out to do work, we have what we call collectible items and non-collectible items. Collectible are like dental, cranial, lung, bone extremities that are diagnostic. If you want to say this is a species or a family tribe, they're easy. But shafts and ribs, we don't really collect them. They are called non-collectible. So in 20, uh, 2008, we started what we call extensive collection at selected sites. Meaning we choose a site, we know the age, we know the area, we collect everything. And we pay attention. <laughs> so we have these two bones. One is a rib bone from an animal like that, buffalo side cattle, and then a goat side antelope. And you can see the marks. And here also. The bones are peppered with all sorts of marks. And we know the site, so they are dated to 3.39 million year old. And the marks, the, 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 these things are marks show deep V-shaped and cross uh, V-shaped in cross section. At that point in 2010, for you to say this is a cut mark or not, the one of the criteria was to show that marks have deep and V-shaped cross sections, like the experimental works that you have here. And this was not done by us, only this part. And yeah, we had that. The criteria, among the criteria, one of them is whether you have marks that show deep and V-shaped, and we have that. Okay, I'm going fast, I know. And you can also look at what we call micro striations. These are marks within the marks, using uh, scanning electron microscopy. And the nature of the micro striations when you use scanning electron microscopy are not going to be the same when the agent is a crocodile or a mammalian carnivore or trampling, meaning animals working on the walking on the bones, or percussion or cut marks when someone is using stone tools. Many of you know of I can go fast. And it appears that ours had the micro striations that are indicative of stone tool use. I'm talking about now 3.3 million year old bones. We even asked some people to do blind tests and they would look at the mark and they would attribute them to cut mark, percussion, or we don't know. And we have 12 marks on these bones I showed you. And the three people agreed on everything, but they couldn't tell whether G1, G2, I'll come back to that. These are two marks where they said, we, can't, we don't know, these are non-identifiable the marks. So we published this paper in 2010, claiming that this is evidence for stone tool use dating back to 3.4 million years ago, probably evidence of meat eating 3.4 million years ago, using sharp edge stone tools. That was a major claim. And because the only species existing at the site at that time is Australopithecus afarensis, we, we said, they were the authors of these marks. Meaning, we pushed the evidence by 800,000 years. Again, huge claim. But we made clear that we're talking about occurrence of that behavior. We don't know the frequency. We don't know how often did they did it. Of course, you can imagine the discourse after that. Some were serious, and some were less serious, actually. Let's talk about the less serious ones. Some said, because they work next to our sites, I don't want to name names, they said they had looked for four decades, they would have found them if they were out there. Well, working at our site, we discovered three new species of carnivores, including a giant otter, which is a donkey-sized animal, so they missed it also. So, <laughs> so if you can miss this, then you can miss really a tiny mark on a bone. So that, that's not really serious. But then there were some who said, these are crocodile marks. Well, but look what crocodiles do to bones. They have this typical puncture drag, puncture drag marks. If taphonomists are here, maybe you can correct me, but that's what you see. 
This is not what you have in the Kita. Look at that. But there were some serious replies to us, and that came from Domingo Rodrigo, who is a great taphonomist in Spain. And he said, these guys are trampling marks, meaning on animals who are walking on, on the bones, they can create, and they do create those marks. The problem is they focused on mark G1 and mark G2, which I told you were identified as non-identified by our taphonomists. That's fine. They ignored the 12 high confidence cut marks and focused just on the two. That was one of the problems. Look, those marks that were, this is our publication. This paper is from their own publication. And we have said we don't know what these marks are, OK? But what was a little upsetting is that they said, and I'm quoting them, mark A1 and A2, those marks, are morphologically compelling in their similarity to verified cut marks created by stone tools used in experimental butcheries, meaning they accept that our marks are good. They continue to say they sh they, the marks show deep V-shaped cross-sections and contain microstriations, and the existing criteria at the time were this. So they agree. What is problematic is what they say next. They say, in a less contentious context, the marks would likely be accepted as genuine cut marks. Meaning, if these guys were two million years old or associated with homo, they would be accepted as genuine cut marks. I think that is a problem not only for paleoanthropology, but just for science. I am of the view that we should follow the data and make ourselves wrong if we are wrong. So this claim is uh, not acceptable to me. I think the best way to uh, agree against this is to develop new methods and demonstrate indeed that they are not cut market bones. So I would conclude that two years and meat eating before 2.5 is not a surprise, not contentious, but our finds actually allowed us to come up with no hypothesis and test all hypothesis. We need a rethinking of our theoretical framework. I remember when I was young, I wanted to look for stone tools at sites that are old, were older than three million years. The PI told me that's just BS, stop. <laughs> because Australopithecus is not meant to make stone tools. But there were some good questions, where are the stone tools? And we don't have stone tools. These are from a younger, as you can see, from a younger site. But the question is, and I'm finalizing now, what type of tools are we looking for when we go to sites that are 2.6 million years old? Well, imagine you are an uh, industrial archaeologist and you have this iPhone today. If you go to the, uh, this time period, you're not going to find that phone, but this one, which does not mean that they did not have phones. In the same way, you can go to 2.6 million years ago, find that, but you don't know what to find here. So you have to keep your eyes open. And when people did that, this was published in 2015, for five years after our publication. So and that's why I think we need a framework, a theoretical framework that is open to new discoveries and new ideas. In fact, we have a new hypothesis called the human predatory pattern, which separates the issue of origins from the issue of later elaboration. Any behavior, any morphology will have an origin and an elaboration. So threshold, threshold one would be stone to use opportunistically, like I think Australopithecus did. And the second would come with hominins, where they would be sites of accumulation of stone tools, like at Gona, for example. So that is the old picture of Australopithecus. I think this is more realistic picture of Australopithecus today. I am sorry I took longer. The adventure continues, so I'll show you maybe a discovery that is upcoming. I don't know if you can see something here. It is continuing discoveries. And this is another skull that we're working on. So stay tuned. I'm very sorry I took longer. Uh, but I hope it was not painful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Wasn't that a pleasure? So, before... <laughs> We ask Zerai a few questions, not many. I just want to say thank you so much for that. Thank you for uh, reinforcing my statement to my students that they have to pay attention to the shoulders. <laughs> that Australia Peterson's shoulders have half the story. And thank you also for the challenges at the end about let's think more open-mindedly about how we interpret things and how we approach the past. So. Zerai, I am sure we're going to have questions in this audience. Do I have a question? Amelie? <laughs> I was going to say Amelie and Robert not allowed, but anyway, Amelie. Um, well, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I have so many questions that I would like to ask one. There is a question and a comment. So I'm also convinced that the most repetitious use to it's it's meat in some way. Do you think there's a correlation and what kind of correlation we have between the fact that they had a childhood and also they were also using tools to eat meat? So I guess in terms of metabolism, something happened. So do you have any idea about, no. yeah? So, uh, Fee, didn't hear, it, will there be some link between the use of tool and the potential presence of childhood in Australopithecus Australopithecusophrensis? My answer is, I'm struggling the two questions separately that connect them needs more data. So I'm not going to venture into the answer. <laughs> 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 They're already hard on their own. <laughs> uh, that being said, with the incorporation of meat using the stone tools, albeit sporadic, have contributed to aspects of childhood, perhaps. But it's, they're really two difficult topics. And when we combine them, they become even more. Com Actually, we need someone like uh, Rob, who right, likes to think big and uh, help us answer those questions. I'm thinking now. Yes. <laughs> Do we have another question for Zerai? Yes, yes, Matthew. Oh, lovely talk. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering what you made of the new uh, dates of the um, layers that the store content case of Australopithecus, uh, because we thought for a while that the one in East Africa was much more than the one in South Africa, but now with the new age of 3.5 million years old, um, I don't know like, what you think of that. Yeah, it's, uh, so uh, there is a new date for South African Fontaine sites to 3.5-ish. Uh, I think that's welcome. From That would be relevant not from the topics covered today, but from the phylogenetic uh, perspective. I think, if you ask me, uh, and I'll say it soon in a nature paper, actually, maybe a couple of months, I, I see Australopithecus uh, being a pan-African genus, as you know, from Czech to South Africa to uh, Tanzania, Kenya, all of that. What, what, what the way I see it is that there is this long-lived species, uh, uh, something like Australopithecus afarensis, starting from 4.2 all the way to uh, 2.9. And I can see that migrating species, southwards and westwards, are, uh, 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 especially in South Africa, you have uh, Sediba, which seems to have descended from uh, Afrikaans. Uh, you have uh, 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 Nalevi, which seems to have evolved from uh, Erectus in situ. Uh, I think the path that goes from 4.2 all the way to 2.9 is giving rise to uh, species, species, uh, different species in different parts of Africa uh, in sort of a budding form of uh, speciation. So uh, the South African specimen being dated to 3.5 is not shocking to me. I can see an earlier population of afarensis like thing going further south and evolve independently in South Africa. Same thing, so, uh, Sediva would do the same thing, uh, Nalidi would do the same thing. Uh, so uh, it, it didn't shock me. Uh, I think the uh, material from South Africa is just phenomenal. In fact, most of our knowledge initially came from South Africa. So if from the phylogenetic point of view, I, I, I see that an earlier population of Africans may have migrated south and evolve it to be Australopithecus africanus. Oh, 
but we're going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, and then we'll go. Yes, then. Today, you mean Homo sapiens today? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm not not sure if I can answer that from an expert uh, point of view because humans are a totally, you know, weird species. They have all sorts of new things to them. Uh, that being said, however, that caring for infants uh, is not uniquely human. What is unique in humans is it's protracted. If one is going to claim that they care uh, about their infants uh, better than you know many even birds, you know they they they, they firstly protect their, their infants, uh, many species and, and mammals and uh, maybe reptiles. So uh, I, I I would say that uh, yeah we we take it to an extent. Uh, again, I'm not answering this as, as an expert. I think we take it to an extent. Uh, that the dependence continues so far to actually we're caring for grown-ups now. So where do you then draw the line between adulthood and childhood is something that uh, intrigues me as a question. Uh, because if you have uh, a grown-up, uh, if this pattern continues and we continue to care for grown-up, would that be the new uh, attribute characterizing homo sapiens? I think one can reflect on that, but again, I underscore, I'm not answering this as an expert. These are just my thoughts that happen in my mind. <laughs> thank you. So let's thank Zerai for a wonderful lecture and wait before. Everybody's invited to come back to the McDonald's and have a drink and kind of pace. Yeah. Thank you.